Uh, thank you, Senator Rhiannon, for your contribution. Senator Wright. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. So I too rise to speak on the Renewable Energy Electricity Amendment Bill 2015. And first up, I want to place on the record that we need to consider this bill in the context of a government that has a completely irrational antipathy towards renewable energy. How do we know that? Well, let me count the ways, and I'll come back to this in more detail later, but I think it's really important for anyone looking at these debates in the future, and I'm sure they'll pour over them and think, what were they thinking at the time with all the evidence that we know now about the, the direction in which we need to go in Australia? They will say, how could this have been? We have, um, we, have Mr. we have Joe Hockey and his comments about hating wind farms. We have um, the Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, and his comments previously about hating wind farms. We have an ostensible review of the renewable energy target. In the face of a promise before the election that the government wouldn't be changing the target, we have a review. Um, and uh, the person appointed to run that review is someone who has a history of denying the reality of human-induced climate change and having worked in the fossil fuel industry. That said, I know that there must be, and that there are coalition MPs and senators who don't have an antipathy to renewable energy, who, don't, who do understand the challenge that we're facing in relation to climate change. And I'd like to think that they are looking on in horror at the stance that is being taken resolutely by their leadership at this time in history. And particularly, I know, if they have kids and they have grandkids, they know that the decisions that we are making today will inevitably have far-reaching consequences that we will all be held responsible for. So here we have a bill that will reduce R -E -D -U -C -E, the target for the amount of renewable energy that we will have available to us in 2020 by 8,000 gigawatt hours at a time when countries around the world are doing the opposite. So the worldwide investment in renewable power generation in 2014 was almost double that of fossil fuels. And in early 2014, 144 other countries had renewable energy targets. I deplore the reduction of the renewable energy target from a target of 41,000 gigawatt hours by 2020 to 33,000 gigawatt hours. I also deplore the fact that this legislation exempts heavy trade exposed industries and that will have the effect of shifting more costs onto households and businesses. Hard to reconcile when we think about the rhetoric of this government, but don't listen to what they say, look at what they do. And I deplore the changes to regulations associated with this legislation that will allow native forests to be burnt again. Burning wood for energy to keep us warm and later to heat water to create steam to turn turbines that was something that we did in the past. That was the Industrial Revolution that saw forests destroyed to feed the fires, to drive the looms and machines. Who would have thought in 2015 that we would be returning to a situation where we would be classifying the burning of trees as renewable energy, when we in fact have the technology we have infinite supplies of sunshine and wind that can fuel the energy needs of the future. And not only that, but risking burning hot, we risk burning whole logs in forest furnaces in an irresponsible and desperate attempt to prop up an industry that is incapable of being economically sustainable without huge government subsidies. And it's there on the public record, the amount of money that goes into propping up the forest industry. And this is just one more example of that. But the other thing is that people need to understand this will also have the effect of undermining further the investment in the real clean energy, like solar and wind, because allowing the burning of biomass will actually take up a proportion of the target, about 15 per cent 
to use the forest industry's own figures. But why is it? Why would a government create uncertainty in the way that they've done? What evidence is there that they have been deliberately destabilising and undermining the renewable energy sector? Can it just be a matter of aesthetics? Because we know, we know that, um, that Joe Hockey hates wind farms. He told us in May last year when he was speaking to Macquarie Radio and he was asked about whether the government would target clean energy programs in its quest for massive spending cuts. And he said, he was very candid, he said, well, they say get rid of the clean energy regulator, and we are, he said. And he then mounted an attack on wind farms, specifically the wind turbines operating outside our national capital here in Canberra. He said, if I can be a little indulgent, please, I drive to Canberra to go to parliament. I drive myself and must, I must say I find those wind turbines around Lake George to be utterly offensive. I think they are a blight on the landscape. He wasn't asked his opinion about the look of power stations, coal-fired power stations, nuclear power stations. But he's not on his own. It must be something about being on radio that encourages an intimate sharing tone among members of the Cabinet. So we had the Prime Minister last week speaking to Ellen Jones and confessing that he finds wind farms visually awful. They make a lot of noise. He was very frank last week, was our Prime Minister. He said, what we did recently in the Senate was reduce, Ellen, reduce, capital R-E-D-U-C-E, -E, the number of these things that we are going to get in the future. Now, he said, I would have frankly liked to have reduced the number a lot more. But we got the best deal we could get out of the Senate. And if we hadn't had a deal, Alan, we would have been stuck with even more of these things. So that's the Prime Minister's own words. And then we had the review of the RET last year, where the hand-picked reviewer, Dick Warburton, had worked as a former Caltex chairman in the fossil fuel industry. He denies the, the uh, evidence of human-induced climate change, and he's a pro-nuclear advocate. The cost of that review was over half a million dollars. The review's own RET modelling showed that keeping the renewable energy target at its level or expanding it further will actually push power prices down. Again, I ask, when we think about the rhetoric of this government that professes to be so concerned about the cost of living for people in Australia, why is it, if they were really serious about relieving electricity bills, wouldn't they be lifting the target, not reducing it? So we have a RET that is reducing pollution, creating jobs and bringing power bills down. Why? Why would any responsible, thoughtful, orderly, methodical government set about to destabilise it? And I think the answer comes back to something that quite a lot of people have explored during this debate, and that's the influence of mates. So we have mate Morris Newman, chairman of the Prime Minister's Business Advisory Council, who talks about uh, the RET and renewable energy and climate change not being about facts or logic, but being concerned about a new world order under the control of the United Nations. We know that the government has many mates in the fossil fuel st sector who stand to lose a lot if the push to renewable energy continues unabated. Indeed, Minister McFarlane, Ian McFarlane, cut, let the cat out of the bag last September when on ABC Radio he told us there's about 9,000 megawatts, around five to nine coal power generators excess capacity, which would be driven out by clean energy under the existing act. Of course, this will happen. This will happen. We are moving inexorably away from fossil fuels to a clean, decarbonised energy future. And trying to prevent it is as ludicrous as trying to, ludicrous as trying to turn back the tide. But what we see here is Fossil fuel investors, uh, fossil fuel companies, people who stand to make a lot of money out of the industry, determined to prolong the carnival as long as possible and make as much money in the meantime. And we have a government that is doing everything it can to support that endeavour. But meanwhile, meanwhile, if we think about the effects of the people that this government purports to govern for, the people of Australia, we will have more landscape destroyed by coal and gas mining. We will have stranded assets, worse climate change, 
and we are reducing our readiness to transition to clean energy. As we approach the time, and it will happen, and I fear that it will happen ultimately without much notice in the end, when other na nations decarbonise and stop taking our coal and our gas and our fossil fuels. And that's when we will have a workforce in Australia who will not be transitioned to the clean energy future, who will be out of jobs on a mass level. And given the claims of this government to manage the economy, it is grossly irresponsible to jeopardise both existing jobs but also the jobs of the future by ignoring every indicator that a transition is needed now. And the evidence is there. So we have the clear evidence of the effect of the deliberately induced uncertainty on the part of this government. So the uncertainty has shattered investment confidence. Investment in Australia in all renewables fell 35 per cent in 2014. It was the lowest level since 2009. This at a time when the rest of the world is moving ahead. In China, there was an increase of 33 per cent, in Brazil an increase of 50 per cent, and Australia fell 35 per cent, went 35 per cent backwards last year. In the solar industry, employment fell 28 per cent. 5,000 jobs to 13,000 jobs, and prior to this government being elected, there were 23,000 jobs in the solar industry. This is a government that purports to be good economic managers. 13 large-scale photovoltaic projects went on hold. Large-scale renewable investments fell 88 per cent to $240 million, back to 2002 levels and only four wind farms were being built. Australia fell from number 11 worldwide in relation to large-scale renewable um, investments, so from number 11 worldwide to number 39, behind Burma, Panama, Sri Lanka, Costa Rica and the Honduras. And now we have this proposal that we're debating to reduce the RET, supported by Labor. Yes to reduce the rent to, in, to uh, create certainty. And the only certainty that we really have is that the rent will be reduced. There is certainty that any reduction in the 2020 target will reduce the amount of new renewable energy investment over the next decade. That's certain. As well as that, it's certain that this will significantly damage investments that have already been made in good faith based on the existing legislation, the existing target. There's certainty that reducing the target will have a significant impact on the commercial viability of all current and future projects. Because the value of revenue for large-scale projects is based on the value of renewable energy certificates created by the LRET scheme, and that's determined by the demand and supply dynamics of the market. If the 41,000 gigawatt hour target is reduced, the market dynamics will fundamentally change and the value of RECs will decline. This will correspond to a material reduction in the revenue that a project would receive, and it will result in significant financial impact. And this again at the hands of a government that purports to be responsible economic managers. I want to speak briefly now about the particular perspective of someone coming from South Australia which I'm proud to say is the renewable energy capital of Australia. We have the highest level of energy generated from renew renewable sources in the nation. If the rent is reduced, South Australia— um, there, there is a point of order. <laughs> Senator Singh. Thank, um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Whilst I acknowledge that South Australia is— um, oh, sorry, point of order. Whilst I acknowledge that South Australia is going ahead in leaps and bounds in renewable energy, Tasmania still remains uh, the renewable energy th th capital of Australia. Uh, th th thank, thank you, Senator Singh. There, there, there is no point of order, and I, I will remind the Senator that uh, frivolous point of, points of order are not going to be tolerated in this Senate while I chair. Uh, <laughs> Senator Wright.
We, I must admit it's a healthy debate to be having. I, I think it's really important that we are vying to be the renewable capital of Australia, but I'm afraid um, I have uh, to— uh, Senator, through the chair. Yes, yeah, through the chair, but I have to, Chair, I have to— or, Mr Acting Deputy President, I have to say that the evidence is there that, indeed, South Australia is the renewable energy capital of Australia, and I'll go on to establish why. Um, so the— <laughs> South Australia has the highest percentage of homes with solar panels, 23 per cent, the most energy sourced from renewables and the most investment at risk. $2.9 billion of investments in clean energy, and there's a risk that that will go overseas if there is not enough certainty and if the rent is reduced. There are South Australian projects at risk. There's the Ceres Wind Farm on the York Peninsula, a $1.5 billion investment and more than 500 jobs. There's the Infigen Energy Wokewine wind farm in the southeast, 150 jobs created. There's the Pacific Hydro Kyneton wind farm in the Riverland, more than 500 jobs created. And we have Port Augusta, where recently, of course, there has been an announcement that the Alinta, the two coal-fired power stations near Port Augusta, the Alinta uh, power stations, will be closed by 2018, which will indeed. Um, introduce the possibility that, Australia, that South Australia will become the first totally renewable energy um, state in Australia. South Australia has 517 accredited solar installers, 16 wind projects of 561 turbines and 1,205 megawatts of capacity. But today, the solar industry and other solar industry, um, uh, of, for instance, Tindo Solar, which is the only Australian produced um, solar panels um, and other solar industry representatives are saying that there will be damaging job losses in South Australia, which is already, of course, experiencing significant job losses in many other areas of manufacturing, um, if the renewable energy target is changed and reduced. The predictions are that large-scale solar, large solar will beat wholesale coal power pricing anywhere in Australia by 2020 in less than five years. But when we come back to the closure of the coal-fired power stations near Port Augusta, we also know that there is an extremely strong community push from the residents and also from the council and from many others for a concentrating solar thermal plant. There's been a lot of work done on the feasibility of that plant with the potential for baseload power to be uh, created there using molten salt. It's a very exciting initiative. There's a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm in the community and, as I said, with the council, because there has been a long history of um, damaging health effects of the coal-fired power stations in Port Augusta. And moving to a solar thermal uh, power station would be an amazing opportunity for South Australia to showcase baseload power. There would be jobs available for the existing power workers to be able to work there, and there would also potentially be jobs in manufacturing in creating the components the mirrors that would be used and the panels in any associated wind farms as well. So there's a lot of good things happening in South Australia. It's absolutely imperative that those things are happening in South Australia because it is a state where there are um, significant challenges in terms of other manufacturing. It's a state which this current government is ignoring at this stage, and if they are insistent on going ahead and allowing the passage of this legislation to further undermine the renew renewable energy target, that will only make the situation far worse for South Australia. So I urge my colleagues to think seriously about this legislation, to think about the future, to think about what we're doing, and not to be beholden by short-term um, interests in maintaining and propping up an energy source that we know has health um, effects, that is contributing to climate change, that is more expensive than the alternatives. Um, and to vote against uh, this legislation. Uh, thank you, Senator Wright, for your contribution.